So I want to talk a little bit about um, the, the policy model in, in more detail. So um, to sort of start off the story, like I've done, so if you think about how you might develop a policy model, so, and I've done this before in my career, it's you sort of collect all your requirements from all your customers, internal and external, you get a few smart people on a whiteboard, and you start trying to figure out, well, what is the, what is the policy model that will sort of address all those concerns? Um, then what happens is you go and implement that policy model and functionally, oh, it all works and addresses those customer things. And then you get to the point where you say, make that scale, right? Make that scale to hundreds of thousands of workloads, large enterprises be able to do that. And then you realize, okay, you just created an order, you know, N squared algorithm in terms of policy computation and the thing cannot scale, right? So again, having the experience in my career, I had done that before and I've learned from my mistakes. So when we sort of started Illumio, we, st we, we started something, we wanted to start with a very simple, a very simple model. One that we knew we could make scale, all right? Um, another thing, so we started with this kind of one dimensional group based model, right? Because that, that, that can be, has shown to be able to scale. And it turned out that there was actually still more complexity that we wanted from some early customers that we tried this out. And then we sort of evolved the policy model to what we, what we end have, have now is this kind of multi-dimensional, specifically these four dimensions, it's a four-dimensional policy model, right? Um, and you sort of describe the policy in terms of labels and relationships, right? So the labels are these four dimensions, right? How you just sort of describe a workload or tag a workload, right? So there across these four, and we have the, our acronym is RAIL, and the, the model is there's a, so a role, you start with a role. A role is a part of an application. What is the role the application plays? For example, a web tier, app tier, a database tier. And none of these things are, are hard-coded in our system, right? They're whatever is appropriate for the, whatever, whatever is appropriate for the, for the customer and the customer's deployment. Um, then you have an application. And an application sort of, that's, this is an application class, right? You might have, you might be doing um, you know, multiple instances of this application. In fact, the other one is environment. You might have multiple environments that are hosting this application, right? As it moves through the software development cycle from dev to prod to, to production. And so this is an ERP example. So let's say you're developing a new ERP application. You, you know, you started in development. You have an instance of it. You build a model, right? You build this policy model um, and um, you label it, you label it like that. Um, and then you move it into test and into production. That model can actually follow the software development cycle uh, through, through the deployment process, that, the security model. Um, and then the fourth one is location. Uh, and location is, like it, it's marked as US here, but location can be whatever the end user wants it to be. It could be an, like an Amazon data center, or you know, um, a, a, you know, data center, or it could be you know, geolocation, or it could be um, you know, down to a rack or a, a, a subset of a data center that you want. And that's how you sort of label these workloads. How you get these labels, like often if people are doing a, you know, a dev, following a DevOps model, you already have some of these labels in kind of your chef or puppet you know, or, or Ansible repositories. Other people have CMDBs that they do have uh, uh, some of this data and some people have, uh, some people don't have it and then we have to sort of discover it and that's where illumination, illumination also helps this process. So that's the first step. Secondly, and as I sort of mentioned, policy is really about a relationship, right? So this is a white, white, white list model. So in this case, I'm just going to say there are really two policies that we're writing. We're sort of saying the web tier, from a modeling point of view, the web tier can talk to the app tier, and the app tier can talk to the database tier. All right, so at that point, there is no interweb tier traffic unless you sort of specify it. You can, but in this model, in the model you don't. Or this, in this use case, you don't. Um, and then what happens is once these workloads are either, these workloads are spun up and sort of, um, sort of are labeled and sort of the security model is uh, applied, right? So what we do is PCE, which is the thing at the bottom, will actually sort of provision all the necessary instructions based on the, based on the policy that you, that, you, that you wrote. And some of the interesting things here are there's actually two points of enforcement, right? If you sort of think about there is when the, when the traffic leaves the web tier, Right? There is a point of enforcement in terms of IP tables or WFP where we actually check to make sure it's traveling to one of the app tier components. When it arrives at the second, at the app tier, this is the second check, it actually is checked to make sure it has arrived from one of the, the, the valid web servers. So at that point, there are actually two points of enforcement along every kind of network path 
uh, that, 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 w that we can sort of uh, program. And that's why we can have unmanaged workloads also in, also in this model. We actually, at that point, you're only doing one half of it, um, but you can still, if you had a NetApp filer where you couldn't install a VEN, you can still control access from a tier of the workload to that, to that unmanaged workload because you can still have the egress point of control. Um, and then what's important is um, as things change, right? And this is also where we've built a lot of intellectual property. As things sort of change, the policy compu co compute engine understands those changes, understands the impact of those changes, and actually only reconfigures the necessary and, impact and impacted things. So uh, back to the point about using you know, graph algorithms, understanding a, a node on a graph, understanding who all, what all the edges are sort of connected to it, to be able to sort of push out a minimal policy. Um, to only the impact of workloads. Secondly, we sort of focus on being able to provide like a diff of what the policy is, right? What is the minimum thing that we need to sort of tell the workloads to sort of accomplish that change, right? And that's how this, uh, that's how the, the change model is uh, um, uh, taken care of. Questions on the policy model? Is that uh, being, go ahead, Matt. No, you go for it. Is that being built like dynamically based on the illumination? Like kind of phase one, I like guess you. So what, what's to stop it from just having somebody that gets into your web tier and is just trying to poke at your app tier on some like let's just say port ten. I don't I don't care, right? Uh, but it's like some erroneous BS that you don't want to have. Okay, and we have a picture of that in like okay. a few minutes, and I'd love to, I want to show you the picture and uh, in a, in a few minutes. Pictures are good. I can deal with pictures. Who ends up writing the policy? So, so it depends, right? Um, there are kind of, you know, we, we have two kinds of groups, right? One, is you, uh, it is the kind of ministry of policy where there is a central kind of authoring organization. <coughs> so it depends on your organization. The other one is we've, what we're sort of seeing is people want to distribute policy authoring. Because if you have central policy authoring, then that becomes a bottleneck, right? And then it's like, why can't, why can't we deliver this application more quickly? It's well, because they couldn't write the policy you know, efficiently enough. Even with some of these tools, it will make it go faster. What we sort of see is, um, People want to push this out to early in the development process, right? Can you author an initial policy in development, right, that you can actually test the policy, right, in, when you're doing the, the test phase of the product, and then sort of make sure it's approved and, you, and, and approve the process, approve the policy during the, the into, into the production phase. So having the having it part of the software development lifecycle um, sort of speeds the the. Uh, Beats, beats the process. I guess, I guess the reason I asked the question, the, the, one of the things I'm struggling with is that, and I'm sure you're going to get into much more detail on the policy language later, um, but there's a lot of what you've talked about that's sort of done in part by other things. You know, developers, when they push their applications into some of those staging environments, things of that nature, they're going to use things like you know, Docker Compose or Kubernetes services definitions, things like that. And I'm just curious if there's anything that you could possibly glean from that. Instead of forcing them to write an Illumio policy, from scratch sort of at every stage, right? They're already doing a lot of these mappings in those tools already. Is there nothing you could glean from that to sort of get no, and I, so 80, 90%? I, I, I agree completely, right? And that's where, uh, back to my point about we have open interfaces, right? So, and, so we have customers who aren't doing that, right? And have these CMDBs and have these other things. We need to have an open interface in which to, uh, you know, uh, suck in some of that information, but I think you'll sort of see over time us getting uh, tighter and tighter with any kind of repository of information where those things are already described, yeah. just being able to leverage those things and implement them. Right? Yeah, because that could be like a, like a really big simplification of communications between <laughs> disparate silos, right? Hey, security guy, uh, the developer has this Docker Compose file that says this application should work this way from their perspective. We good? Yeah, check it off. We're good. I, I agree completely. That is how that, some that is how that is how, in my opinion, how the security community wants to sort of push, right? Because yeah. they don't want to be the roadblock in everything, right? They want to sort of figure out how we can make the application development cycle go qu more quickly, but still have it be secure, right? Yeah. And have it, have that some of that in, some of that. Uh, policy authoring or understanding some of those things more distributed and pushing down in the software development cycle are kind of key to making that thing scale. So I agree completely with that. I've got, I've got a question from Phil Gervasi who's watching the live stream. I don't want to misquote him, so I'll just read it to you. He said, how does the policy manager determine business intent? And then to clarify, basically, how does the controller intelligently determine the intent of the network operator based upon the input in terms of business intent. And he said, I assume there are tons of pre-built configurations that exist in some sort of modular form that get executed based on some sort of match rules. 
Or Yishuan Kroll? So, so yeah, why don't you take that one? So, um, one of the things since we've sort of started is we've obviously been in the market for you know, almost 21 months. And um, we started to see like this motion of what we'll call shrink wrap rules for shrink wrap software. So not everybody operates in full DevOps and has developers. We actually have a class of customers where they run Active Directory. Active Directory is spanned out over multiple data centers. And so we come in with actually rules customized for Active Directory, and you can import those, okay? So you don't have to be like in the policy authoring business if you're using some off-the-shelf software. And that seems to be like one of those use cases that's popping up more and more. I want to wrap my shrink wrap software out of it. The other thing which um, is sort of nice about this is the, the, the labeling uh, structures that like in that ERP prod US, that maps very nicely into RBAC. You can imagine that um, the business intent of somebody who is you know, manipulating or having authoring policy for the ERP application can map directly into who they are inside of the business. So you don't necessarily have to have like somebody who is you know, from the, I don't know, the beverage tracking application team being able to author policy for the ERP application. I hope that actually answers the question. If not, maybe he can clarify a little bit more, we can return to it. Yeah, absolutely. Okay.